was not necessarily always, always successful, and where there was this kind of <clears throat> slippage constantly in, into what was perceived as a sort of a, a sensualist understanding of the, the natural world. So, um, so in terms of um, in terms of the uncanny, which tends to be associated more with uh, images of horror and and discomfort um, rather than images of a kind of perfect world and a, a natural landscape. Um, I mean, I think that um, data visualization has found a way to interestingly kind of naturalize data and statistics that really come from horror and um, not um, represent that source in, in ways where the source becomes oblique. So um, certainly um, in working with um, geometric, geostatic data and um, biological data and understanding the level of manipulation of those data sets by the world of science, I think um, thinking through the metaphors that we use are going to be really, really critical. And um, biological data visualizations tend to be, uh, have a kind of lusciousness to them and a kind of compelling horror also at the same time that um, uh, requires a sort of deep, I think a deep critique of, of the visual structure. Such a partial answer. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this um, fantastic talk, for this fantastic keynote. So no, no doubt when it's uh, um, on the importance of visualization, especially when it comes to big data. Um, I remember a conference at the MIT in 2000 where um, biologists and um, neurologists and, and so on basically presented their, their most beautiful images and, and in a very naive way. Um, and, and then James Elkins stood up on day number two and asked, why were, were not uh, people like Mark Kemp and Margaret Stafford and so on and invited to um, did a lot of research on that? So I, I, um, since we know that um, images, uh, that the natural sciences are relatively new to the field for for the uh, for, um, for images are relatively new field for the natural sciences, and so they are not have, they are not have this knowledge. They don't have this so so well. The, um, they could not develop so so much um, uh, research in, in this. Um, so in Europe, as you know, um, image science developed over the last decade or, or more, and which is also connected with the with, uh, US. And, and, with, and so I wonder, and you have shown so, so wonderful um, the, the role of design. I wonder what, what your impression is uh, what, uh, on the need of an amalgamation between the natural sciences and the humanities, fields like uh, art history, film studies, visual studies, media studies, who have such a, so much uh, in, uh, knowledge on, on images, so to, to uh, better analyze uh, images, better understand images, and so on. Right, I mean, I guess that's the fundamental underlying argument of the paper. You know, it's saying that, you know, there's a whole apparatus that's emerged from the humanities and um, cultural studies, um, over, and, and I think social sciences as well, in terms of understanding uh, you know, position of research and um, the subject subject position of the researcher, and um, that there is very little interaction, as you so well stated, between these bodies of knowledge, which are fundamentally deconstructive and constructionist, and um, and science. And so, um, I mean, part of what the talk does say, though, is that we have to be very careful to not step away from the empirical world. <laughs> You know, um, so there's this constant negotiation between um, the kind of deconstructive capacity that we bring, our ability to um, help science understand its instruments and ways of looking and analyzing, um, and the job that science does as well, which is continually to produce knowledges um, about that construction of reality, which is always emerging. So um, the um, uh, center that we've created in, in Canada is uh, sort of like a cauldron for this because it includes scientists across um, a whole set of disciplines, biomedical researchers, uh, medical researchers, um, artists, humanities researchers, and social scientists, and um, all of our dialogues are fraught at the most basic levels with, with these kinds of challenges. And so, um, I mean, I think the formal I mean, I was very disappointed at the Oxford conference that I, my research world that um, I'm immersed in, and it's, it welds together cognitive science 
um, and, and visual imagery, the analysis of visual imagery and aesthetics. And it, it really um, t sometimes appropriates the kind of knowledges that art history, for example, brings, but it tends to kind of discard those. And I think it's a really important field to watch and to try and intervene into. Thank you. Um, one of the important distinctions you made uh, and, uh, was that between pragmatic versus artistic database, which so often is highly problematic in creating the fissure between arts and sciences. And I was wondering if you could also connect that to the idea of quantitative versus qualitative um, data visualization, which I think is another way of approaching it, meaning simply quantitatively illustrating what is there versus qualitatively approaching questions and what may have uh, not have seen before. Um, I think Ben Fry often starts with um, where the data set doesn't make sense, for example, and takes that as a starting point for the more qualitative um, inquiry. And I was wondering if you could connect that um, pragmatic versus artistic uh, with quantitative versus qualitative. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that those are some of these full distinctions. Um, so, so what I didn't talk about enough is how you know, data, data sets are often really problematic. And that you know part of what you're doing when you're um, undertaking data analysis in the really early instances is trying to understand what's been measured and the quality of that. And that um, part of what's um, increasingly exciting, um, it's an emerging field of data visualization, we're actually working with this in, in our research, um, is to try and find aberrations and mistakes within the data, um, the sort of outliers within data and um, to, to, develop, to develop the kinds of representations that can look for false positives, for example. Um, so we're working with cancer researchers in that area. Um, I, I would argue that um, there always needs to be a qualitative component, even within quantitative visualization, because um, that interaction between the, the, the viewing subject, the reader, requires um, an interpretive lens that allows them to use that visualization either as, as a utility in the raw sense or as something that provokes new kinds of understandings. So it's always designed. I mean, there, there's, this, there's this notion that somehow that, that sort of subjective act of, of making it, you know, if you, if you work in the field of data visualization, you know you are always designing. So the qualitative is, is always present. Hello. Hi. Okay. You got me. Okay. Um, what really fascinated me uh, that you brought up about your methodology was this emotion extraction, and I, I wonder if you could clarify that because I'm a bit confused how that relates to metadata and how that relates to some kind of context of extraction that, that is kind of universalized, and I, I wasn't really clear on that. Right. Well, that's you know, um, that's one of the challenges with um, working in effective computing is there's a lot of debates about um, how we measure effective motion within, um, within data sets. And, um, and then what you, how you might express that then moves you into all kinds of um, creative or artistic metaphors. But um, there's different <clears throat> systems that um, uh, psychologists have developed for measuring what they describe as you know, basic human emotions. And so, um, in the system that I built with Code Zebra, I took a lot of creative license with that. I spent a lot of time immersed in um, reading just online dialogues and kind of adapted in a somewhat playful way this method, which is Plutchik's method, where there's sort of nine different affective types and kind of warp those. Um, and so, uh, the problem is, um, you know, in my way, my tirade around cognitive science is equally applicable to emotional analysis. So I read a lot of the literature. I've tried to provoke the computer scientists I'm working with to look at this body of literature and look at which kind of categorizations make sense and how to build a flexible system so that we can test different ways of oops, measuring emotion 
um, from the data in terms of building these different characteristics um, and look at what comes up from that and then how that might be represented. So in terms of what we're actually quantifying, you know, we're looking at um, text words that represent emotional expression within specific linguistic forms. Um, my own work didn't look at text because I wasn't interested in um, using that kind of computational uh, methodology. I looked at um, things like uh, shouting online, use of emoticons, um, uh, exclamation marks, structure of text, level of interaction, and then kind of cat cat categorize those according to the, the sort of nine types, typologies. Yeah, and that you showed a pipeline where your university were developing an actual algorithmic method for yeah, extraction. Is that based on what you just described? It's exactly what I've described. Okay. So they're, they're working, I mean, they, what they've done is they've taken the work I did, you know, 10 years ago, um, and which was actually, interestingly, accurate in terms of what was going on in computer science. I had, I had no idea at the time. Um, and then... Um, you know, their sort of literature of computational methods to extract emotion, we've kind of pulled those together. And it's quite a good dialogue because, you know, I've kind of done this before and I'm way more skeptical than they are about effective computing. So that's exactly what we're doing. Oh, oh. Yes, uh, I want to ask you uh, what is how to segment the application. Uh, don't you think that the historical avant-garde uh, were more successful? in their more symbolic presentation of uh, uh, science, things like uh, uh, futurist the movement, and uh, uh, futurist about movement, Kantinsky uh, uh, about uh, universe feeling, and uh, uh, other on numbers and so on. They were much more symbolic, of course, than uh, nowadays. But I think uh, this uh, presentation of the Big Bang, you've seen before, it's a uh, weak, um, compared to what visual arts in the visual arts field are doing and uh, weak towards uh, the sheer statement of pure data. No? Maybe because uh, we are dealing today with uh, processes and not with image, not with optical things. Uh, you know what I mean? Well, that's interesting. I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's an emerging practice. And, um, you know, some of and I didn't go through my slides and say, I think this one is incredibly successful and this is why. That would be another talk. Um, but, you know, I, th I think some of the imagery, maybe I'll just go back. I, I mean, I think this is an amazing piece of work, you know? <laughs> some piece of technology trees. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, I think that there is a way where. Um, the kind of metaphors that, that begin to emerge, which, you know, you're right. I mean, modernism did that in, in a very pure sense. It was able to imagine and kind of capture those, those processes. Um, but I think what we bring now to visualization is um, a huge lexicon of, of visual languages that can work with, with data sets. And I think we're going to see more and more compelling imagery. The limit is that there is, um, you know, it is indexical. And I guess that's the point I was trying to make, is that there's a way where, um, you know, there's a kind of thread back to the source data. I think for a visualization to kind of operate successfully, there still has to be this kind of reference to the kind of ontological world of its, of its referencing um, and, and, um, and its source. So that wasn't true for um, the futurists. Okay, I would like to say thank you to Sarah Diamond. I'm sure you have more questions and you can ask them in the foyer and uh, you know, tomorrow as well. And thank you, Sarah, for the great presentation. Thank you.